Hello everyone, this lesson is going to be on the brain and specifically taking a look at the two sides of the brain, the left side of the brain, the right side of the brain, and here we're really focusing on the cerebrum. Of course, the cerebrum is made up of those four different lobes, the frontal, parietal, occipital and temporal lobes, and that's what we're kind of going to focus on here. So this picture that we're taking a look at is looking at the brain from above. So we can see it showing the left side and the right side. So that would mean that all of this somewhere in here is going to be the frontal portion of the cerebrum. In here is going to be the parietal portion of the brain we can maybe see, kind of difficult to tell, but maybe some of the occipital lobes and temporal lobe kind of tucked in on the underside. We probably wouldn't be able to see it from a top view here. But those would be the four uh, different lobes. So cerebral asymmetry refers to the fact that even though the two sides of the cerebrum do look pretty much the same, they do have uh, slightly different functions. And that is what the cerebral asymmetry is referring to. Even if we do take a look at this picture on the screen here, we can see that on the left side, compared to the right side, they have some different images indicating that there are some different functions associated with the left side compared to the right side. So we can see on the left side um, some symbols representing language. We can see some pictures here representing speech and vocabulary. We can see something related to math here. So those associated with the left side of the brain. On the right side of the brain, we see a geometric figure. We see a musical instrument. We see a face. And that's the kind of information, as we'll see, that is related to processed on the right side of the brain. So we'll spend a little bit of time talking about this table here. So what I'm giving you along the left-hand side are several different cerebrum functions. And we have differences between the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. The first one that we'll take a look at here is the visual system. Information coming in through your eyes travels to the brain. And even though the eyes are at the very front of your face, where this information is going and where it is eventually processed, at least initially, what we call the primary visual area is in the occipital lobe. And that really is the function of the occipital lobe. It doesn't matter if it's the right eye or the left eye. From either eye, information does go to both the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But for now, what I do have for the left hemisphere is what information is being processed there. So it doesn't matter which eye the information is coming from. If it is information which shows letters, words, sentences, paragraphs, numbers, this information is directed to the left occipital lobe. And it is there that this kind of visual information is processed. What about the right hemisphere? Well, really anything not related to words and numbers. So complex geometric fat patterns, and in particular, we saw on that previous slide, um, a face, a face of Albert Einstein. So that's the kind of information that would be processed in the right occipital lobe. For the auditory system hearing, this information coming in from the ears does go to, well, the lobe in which case is closest to it, and that is the temporal lobes, temporal lobes. So here is where the sound information is processed. Temporal lobes are responsible for some other functions as well. For example, certain aspects of memory, memories are stored in the temporal lobe. And there are some other functions associated with the temporal lobe as well. What sort of information is being processed on the left hemisphere compared to the right though, in terms of sound information? Well, anything language related, language related sounds. So someone talking, someone singing the words from the song, that information, as with the eyes, it doesn't matter which ear it is coming from, it will initially go to both temporal lobes, but then it will be directed toward the left hemisphere, and in particular, the left temporal lobe. What about on the right side? Well, anything non-language related, so environmental sounds. If you think about a bird that's singing, 
if you think about the wind that's blowing through the trees or the grasses, and if you think about instrumental music with no words, that information would be processed in the right hemisphere. So if you are listening to a song, it really depends. Is it a song that has only the words that you're listening to? That would be processed in the left hemisphere. If it's strictly instrumental, that would be the right hemisphere. What about a song with singing and music? Well, that would be in both hemispheres. The next one that I have here is somatosensory. This is really talking about the sensory receptors that you have in your skin and where that information goes to in the brain. So in your skin, you do have receptors for heat and cold, pressure, touch, pain. This information is going to be directed toward the parietal lobe and to the what is called primary somatosensory area which is at the very, very front of the parietal lobe. What's the difference between the left and the right hemisphere? Well, first of all, point, I'll point out that for somatosensory information, all of the sensory information coming from one side of your body is processed on the opposite side of the brain. So if you are feeling something warm in your right hand, that information is directed toward your left parietal lobe. Anything that's coming from the left side of your body is directed toward the right parietal lobe. So the reason for the question here, question mark here, is that really there's nothing else going on, nothing more detailed in the left hemisphere other than the fact that it's processing information coming from the right side of the body. For the right uh, parietal lobe, it's a little bit more complicated. So tactile recognition of complex patterns. So feeling some something with your hand, the texture of it that you're feeling in your hand, that involves tactile recognition. So it doesn't matter what hand it is, some of this information will be directed toward the right hemisphere because it is a complex pattern, something that involves the, the right parietal lobe in this case. And Braille. This one here, reading Braille. This one is a very complex uh, um, recognition pattern using tactile recognition, and that is going to be processed in the right hemisphere. Movement, here we're talking about voluntary movement. So when you make that decision to throw a ball with your right arm, to kick a ball with your left leg, this is a voluntary motor movement. Where that is initiated is going to be in the frontal lobe. So remember that there is that cerebellum. Don't be confused with the function of the cerebellum. That is not where voluntary movement is initiated. Yes, it is necessary for a coordinated voluntary movement, so it's nice and smooth, but where it is initiated is coming from the frontal lobe. In the frontal lobe, there is a region called the primary motor area. Just like at, in the parietal lobe, there is a primary somatosensory area that's at the very front of the parietal lobe. The primary motor area is at the very back of the frontal lobe. So primary motor, primary somatosensory, they are in fact adjacent to each other. Keep in mind there are also other functions associated with the frontal lobe. Big ones for you to remember, personality, behavior, that's associated with the frontal lobe, and what's referred to as executive functions. Things that we can do that our closest cousin chimpanzees can't do, or dolphins can do, or really no other animals can do. So that includes very, very high functioning cognitive abilities, things like planning, organizing, and problem solving. So what about the differences between the left and the right hemisphere? As with somatosensory, there's a 100% crossover. So when you're kicking that soccer ball with your left leg, that is actually initiated in the right frontal lobe. When you're throwing that ball with your right arm, that's initiated in the left frontal lobe. What's the difference between them? Well, we saw that with somatosensory, it was the left side for the complex pattern recognition. In the case of movement, it's the left side that is for complex voluntary movement. So think about very complex things. A couple that I just mentioned, throwing a ball, kicking a ball, those are pretty complex, but nowhere near as complex as something like writing and speaking. Very, very complex voluntary movements, and those would most definitely involve the left frontal lobe. 
Memory, well, I mentioned that the temporal lobe is involved in memory. Frontal lobe is involved in memory as well, and probably, in fact, all four lobes to some extent are involved in some kind of memory. Um, in terms of the two hemispheres on the left side, hopefully you recognize there's a bit of a pattern here. Letters, words, numbers, language, language-related stuff again. So your memory for words, your memory for a sentence, your memory for a poem, your memory for perhaps a phone number, all of this is stored in the left hemisphere. How about the right hemisphere? Your visual memory. So all of those faces that you pass in the hallways, the friends that you remember by their face, that information, that memory is stored in the right hemisphere. Language, uh, for the most part, the left. Most people have their language center in the left. And this one here, it depends upon what aspect of language we're talking about, whether it is the speech, whether it is the writing, whether it is the reading. Uh, this is going to be both frontal, if it's speaking, and the uh, temporal lobe, even the parietal lobe possibly, involved in language. So all of that language-related abilities associated with the left hemisphere. Again, this is in most people. There are some instances where it will be in the right hemisphere, but for most people, the language areas are in the left hemisphere. And the final one that I have here are just some uh, spatial processes and uh, geometry, sense of direction, mental rotation of shapes. That seems to be a function associated with the right hemisphere. So the general summary that I have that I have at the bottom here, left side of the brain, uh, writing and speaking for sure, language related, and to some degree what's referred to as more of a logical or rational side of your brain, whereas the right side, uh, non-language, non-verbal, uh, spatial in nature, and more holistic and intuitive for the right side of the brain. A couple of interesting pictures here. So I did talk about the primary somatosensory and the primary motor area. If we do take a look at this image at the upper left side, what I'm circling here is all of the frontal lobe. And what it shows is that right at the very, very back of the frontal lobe is where we do have the primary motor area or primary motor cortex. So that is the one that is responsible for initiating the voluntary movement. If we take a look at the parietal lobe, I'll circle the parietal lobe here. Something like this would be the parietal lobe. And we can see that right at the very, very front of the parietal lobe is where we have the primary somatosensory area or somatosensory cortex. So they are in different lobes, but as I said, they are adjacent to each other. The primary motor right at the very back of the frontal lobe and the primary somatosensory right at the very front of the parietal lobe. So if we take a look at these other kind of funny pictures down at the bottom here, the one on the left is showing the motor cortex. So this is cutting through the brain. If I can take a look at the picture at the top, kind of cutting through it like this and looking at, well, this one here, we would be looking from the back and looking at the left side of the brain. So this is from the top of the brain here to the side of the brain. And we can see that different portions of the motor cortex are responsible for controlling different parts of your body. So of course, what's really unusual about this is the very, very large hand and thumb and face and tongue. This is a representation of the area, the physical area in the brain, on the cerebrum, the cerebral cortex, the somatosensory area that's dedicated to these parts of your body and the voluntary movement in these parts of your body. So what does that tell us? You need a huge area in your brain to control your facial muscles. You need a huge area in your brain to control your tongue. Why is that? Well, what is the most complex of voluntary movements? Talking. So you need a huge area in your brain in order to control these muscles. Also, the hand. Once again, very, very fine motor control in the hand. So a huge area in the brain dedicated to that. What about the rest of your body besides the face and the hand? Well, that's all of this here. 
So the hip, the knee, the ankle, the toes, all of that. Collectively, the trunk area, the shoulders, the arm, the elbow, not a huge area in the brain responsible for controlling that because we don't have that fine motor control in those areas. The other side, the right side here, is taking a look um, at the somatosensory area. And again, this is the left side that we're taking a look at. And we can see kind of a similar pattern. So this is now sensory information that's coming in. And we can see that there's a huge amount of sensory information coming in from, well, this is your thumb. Huge amount for your thumb. Your hand, your fingers, again, your face, your tongue. So what this says is that these are the most sensitive areas in your body and you need a huge area in your brain in order to process sensory information coming from these regions in your body. And this picture over to the right hand side, equally kind of bizarre, but what it is showing is both the representation of the motor and the somatosensory cortex. It's saying that your brain dedicates a huge physical area for your hands and for your face all of that area for in your brain for a fairly small region in your body compared to, well, this. Look at those skinny little legs. Look at the trunk. Not a huge amount of area in your brain, whether it's motor or somatosensory, that's responsible for the movement or the sensory processing of information coming from those different regions. I mentioned the 100% crossover of information, whether it is motor or sensory information. So um, if we do take a look at this picture here, this is sensory information. So sensory receptors that we have in the fingertip here. As this information goes into the spinal cord, what we can see is that there's a crossover of the information. So if we're taking a look at this one here, and if this is the left hand, the finger on the left hand, this information is going to cross over and eventually it's going to reach the opposite side of the brain, which would be the right side of the brain. So once again, information, sensory information coming from the left side of your body is processed in the right hemisphere. If instead of sensory perception, we were talking about the movement of this finger, if we're moving the left finger, then again, it would be the opposite side of the brain, the right side of the brain, the primary motor area that is responsible for the movement of that finger. And finally here, I did want to come back and just take a brief look at the uh, visual, visual system and how it's a little bit different here. So this picture that we're looking at is viewing the brain and the eyes from above. And instead of talking about information from the left eye going to the right occipital lobe and information from the right eye going to the left occipital lobe, that's simply not the case. So what does this picture here show us? Well, instead of talking about information from one eye going to a particular lobe, what we talk about are visual fields. So what we're taking a look at in this oval up above is the yellow color is the left visual field. The red color is the right visual field. So if we just kind of focus on the right eye, what we can see is that visual information that's coming into the right eye does come from both the left and the right visual field. From the right eye, when you're viewing things to the right, where does that information go? Well, if we kind of trace this, it shows that information from your right visual field in the right eye goes to the left occipital lobe. What about viewing an object with your right eye to the left or in your left visual field? Well, that information comes in and it goes to the right side of the brain. So what does that mean? From each eye, we have some information that's crossing over to the opposite lobe. We have some information that stays on the same side. So instead of talking about from each eye information going to a specific lobe, we talk about the visual field. From both eyes, everything that is in the right visual field ends up going to the left side of the brain. It doesn't matter if it's coming in through the left or the right eye. Everything that is in the left visual field, whether it's coming in through the left or the right eye, it goes to the opposite side, the right side of the brain, 
or the right occipital lobe.